to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. We are uh, actually in chapter 12 and uh, ac- chapters 11 and 12. And um, before I get to uh, the text today, the few things I want to be able to deal with if I can. First of all, I have been gone for three weeks, uh, had quite a bit of travel that I was doing, and it kind of kept me from uh, finishing out this book and beginning the book of Hebrews, which I'll do later this week. And uh, just wanted to uh, kind of bring you all up to speed on what all took place. There were some conferences. Uh, if you've been watching the, uh, the through the Bible studies, you'd notice that I put up some of those sessions uh, from the conferences. And um, there's just a lot going on in the world right now, and uh, especially as far as the church culture is concerned. But um, I'm coming to you, actually, I'm a day late, even with the Nehemiah study, but it is Election Day here in the United States. And uh, I find this in this election being very interesting in light of what's happened in Israel. While I was gone, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is returning to power and uh, is able to form a government there in Israel. Uh, I'm very pleased to say so. And then uh, also to let you know, since Israel is a topic at all times, especially for the church, if we understand what the scripture says, things that take place in Israel are always significant, biblically speaking. And uh, we are going to be going back to Israel. We'll be taking a tour there this coming March 2023 uh, from the 15th through the 27th. And we'd love to have you with us. Uh, We feel that there is so much that's happening in that part of the world and uh, being able to see it. Uh, see the the actual nation of Israel uh, and then be there during this interesting time in the, in the political world. And really, the politics affects things even differently there than they do here, uh, because theirs is a, a matter of very important security and nothing has changed. As we're studying Nehemiah here, uh, the reason for all of the building, if you will, that took place under Nehemiah and at his direction was to give them security. And uh, so today, uh, walls don't protect people any longer, uh, not in the sense of of a nation any longer. It has to be other things. And uh, so Benjamin Netanyahu coming back to power in that part of the world and having the coalition that he does, there's much more of an orthodox influence uh, that's making its way into Israeli politics, this, uh, this government versus the last one. So it should prove to be quite interesting. We would love to have you along on the trip with us. Uh, Some people think it's just not really possible to do it, but maybe you don't know enough about it and uh, maybe uh, would be able to put together the possibility of going. So we would love to take you. And uh, if you're interested in that trip and uh, interested in any of the details, then please contact me uh, soon because I need to get you the information as quickly as I can. Uh, But it will be really good for you to know um, just what to expect and the costs and all of that. So you can contact us through the website at oldpaththeology.net, and I'd love to send you the details on it. So with that being said, um, during the conferences and and really taking a look at at church culture as it sits right now, um, we are really on the cusp of some potentially very, very important things taking place. Uh, on the world stage, and I'm one who just really believes that as the days grow nearer when the Lord returns, I'm of course a believer in the rapture of the church, um, I think that you would get indications that we are are getting closer and closer by just events around the world. And so uh, we do a newsletter, and I've got some things that I've been working on while I've been uh, gone that we'll be putting out here pretty quick. We're going to change a little bit of the format of it that'll direct um, direct more to the things on the website rather than just a, an email with a lot of information. It'll give you a chance to browse through the things that are there at uh, the ministry website. But it is at oldpaththeology.net. And uh, you can look through there. There's uh, All the studies are there, too, in addition to what's at YouTube. And uh, you can contact us through that, through the email that's there, if you want any details on any of the things that I share, uh, or if you're interested in the Israel trip or anything else. So um, I think I may mention also, if you watched any of the presentations that I gave uh, at the various conferences and would like copies of the uh, the presentations themselves in, in PDF format from PowerPoint, I will be happy to send those to you and uh, help you to kind of figure out where I was going because I know that I do speak fast and it's a lot of information, um, but I will be happy to send that to you if it aids in uh, in your study through the, the topics. So with that being said, Book of Nehemiah, as we're at chapters 11 and 12, and you've heard me say this a lot because the Old Testament does pay a close amount of attention 
to um, details from their history and from uh, people and places and really when it comes to matters of genealogy and people that were prominent in particular events, um, the writers are, are very, very careful to record the personages uh, that, are, that are part of the work. And this is one of those cases, even in two chapters worth here, we have uh, chapters 11 and 12, and there is a great deal of, of uh, information that is presented, and it's, it's in, in, in every attempt to be very, very thorough in the documenting of who was involved at what part and why, because that should be remembered. And uh, the families that were faithful to this and this work of coming back from their captivity, though some remained uh, still at Babylon and throughout the, uh, the Persian Empire by this time, uh, Medo-Persians had now taken over from the Babylonians. So throughout the, the empire, if you will, if the, of the Persians, not all the Jews had come back. But the ones that did were, were there for recognition. And you can tell the reason why it was so important that they keep these kind of records. We're going to notice, and it's very subtle, that people went back to the place of their heritage. Now, think about this. Um, most, if not all, of the people that are there at this point, by the time of all this dedication, uh, probably had, well, they wouldn't have ever seen what we're talking about here um, because it's it's so far removed from when Babylon had taken uh, taken Jerusalem, pretty much wiped it out, and took all of the, the people captive of it that weren't killed and didn't get away. So the people that are back, back there now are going back to their ancestral lands, their pieces of land, and without proper information and without proper, proper documentation through the ages, there would be no way that they would know where to go and where did they come from. So the Jewish people, to their credit, and I, I believe actually at the, at the uh, direction of God, whether it was that obvious or not, would want to make sure that this was all preserved this information so that they're able to do the things like they're doing right now. And then again, it's good that history will record those who were faithful to the nation versus those ones who were not faithful to the nation. And that's what we're looking at here. So um, really, really interesting as you look at it from that point of view. Uh, their history is, of course, of, of vital importance to them. And it makes for interesting reading for us. Now, we're not going to go through every one of the names. We'll just kind of highlight some of the big pieces of this. So uh, we get to chapter 11. Let's have a word of prayer and let's take a look at our text. Father, we thank you as we come to your word that you give us assistance in our understanding by your spirit and that you would have us to understand even these bits of detail here and why would it be important and why did they put so much of an emphasis on such things as worrying about names and families and places and, uh, Lord, as we study through it, we already understand the, the, uh, the answer to that. And it is because it is a land that you have given to them. And so we ask that you would help us as we see that. And as we pray for Israel, as we should be in these days, and especially in these days, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to remember that for thousands of years you have been doing this work in these people. And you have great future work still to do. May we be prayerful and mindful ourselves at the same time to recognize that if our names would be written in such a book like this, that we would be seen as faithful. And we give you all thanks and praise in Jesus' name. All right, so chapter 11 starts out this way. <clears throat> now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine-tenths were to dwell in the other cities. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Now, that doesn't mean that we have contradictory information here. It means that they were going to determine by lot who was going to be that one out of ten people that would go from where they are to have a representative that lived in Jerusalem. And that would be, uh, would be to make sure that there was all the things that the city would need in the commercial sense, in the security sense, in every particular sense, having the, the city occupied by its people would be very, very important. Now, if you want to live in Jerusalem, it's, it's no small matter. It's very, very pricey for the few that can do it. Um, but back in this time, people would rather be in their ancestral lands where they came from if they weren't from in the city. But you'll notice that the people uh, from verse 1, by verse 2, it would appear as though those, lost, those lots had been cast. But the people who were, who, who were put in this position, you were there chosen by lot, uh, accepted the responsibility and they did so with gladness. So, you know, when I read through these kinds of passages like this, 
you can almost read through this like it was some kind of a novel. It doesn't even have to sound, or you could probably read novels like this, something along these lines that could be completely fictitious. And then there are these times when we're reading this kind of history where it actually took place, and it's good for us to put ourselves in that kind of a situation and say, you know, what would it be like? After all the years of displacement and then every other nation that was ever conquered like this, they never came back. And so the idea that there would be those who would come back, and this is God's way of doing things. Because remember, the same group of people that would be brought back and rebuild the temple um, would still once again go from the Persians to really under the controls of, uh, of the Greeks if something were to break out, and then ultimately to the Romans. The Romans ultimately displaced them yet again, and they were gone for 1,900 years until the middle of last century. And yet again, God has brought a people who were conquered and driven out and really kind of absorbed into what was there of Rome, and, uh, and you know, the people that scattered um, would have just not had a nation of their own. And yet God brings them back after 1900 years. And you have to just ask yourself of all of the civilizations that have come and gone through the years, how many have that kind of a resurgence that they're the same people with the same language and the same belief system that they had when they were first displaced? And it simply doesn't exist. Just uh, in case you're wondering, it doesn't exist. And so when we read this, it is good for us to recognize that through the ages, even in their disobedience, God has made forever promises to this nation. And you can picture yourself as Nehemiah or one like him and just thinking what we're doing now is of such great importance. It should be memorialized. It should be recorded. We should know about these things and we should take care to, to uh, uh, write them down. So here these people were willing to do so. And it tells us in verse 3, that these are the heads of the provinces who dwell at Jerusalem. But in the cities of Judah, everyone dwelt in his own possession in the cities, Israelites, priests, Levites, Nethanim, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. So Israelites, again, you, you'll probably have, though, let's remember by this time, we're talking about Jerusalem. And the conquered nation at the time was what we would call Judah, primarily Judah and Benjamin of those two tribes. The rest had been, for the most part, kind of absorbed into Assyria hundreds of years prior to this. Now, there would be people from other tribes that would kind of intermarry and they would come into the, the area around Jerusalem and, uh, and around you know that, that whole area, the whole part of Benjamin and Judah. So you would have other tribes represented, but when it says Israelites, that would be the people who hold to uh, the God of Abraham and that they are the descendants of Abraham through Isaac to Jacob and through Jacob's sons, they being the members of the tribes, are mentioned here as Israelites, though we are talking about the area primarily uh, of, of Judah and Benjamin. And that's what's being mentioned here. Now, it gives the impression from the, the descriptions of some of these places that the people who had come back from their captivity are going to get to areas even outside of what would have been uh, Judah and Benjamin. When you see the names of these places, it spreads throughout there. But really the only kind of government, if you will, that's really left is there at Jerusalem inside the territory of Judah and just to the north of them, the smaller uh, section of the tribe uh, belonging or of that area belonging to the tribe of Benjamin. So just interesting, again, that the intrigues of this and uh, the details that we get from the text are just, to me, they're very fascinating. So we get to verse 4. It says, Now also in Jerusalem dwelt some of the children of Judah and the children of Benjamin. So there are the, the people that are all kinds of different people from the tribes, in addition to the ones that are mentioned here as the, uh, the priests in verse 3, Levites, Nethanim, and the descendants of Solomon's service. Uh, Nethanim and, and the Solomon service are, are kind of additions to the ones that would come alongside and, uh, and be help to the Levites and to the priests in particular. So you have all of, if you will, the, the people necessary for the uh, work of the temple and for all of the things that would be supportive of that. But then you have just the common people who are part of the territory, and there they are. They're all being represented and spoken of here. In verse 4, the second half, you have the, the children of Judah. And so these would be kind of the heads of the tribes. These are the prominent people. So again, they're recorded. These prominent people, this would be their line, their families. And it just shows who is the, the heads, who had the, the positions, if you will, at the time. In verse 7, we get those that are mentioned of... Um, 
of Benjamin. And you'll notice that in these ones, uh, a lot of times when you write back or read back through them, you'll go, you'll see how far back it goes into their history because of the children of Judah, when you start working backwards and you read there, you get the son of Mahalalel of the children of Perez. And that gives you an idea how far back we're talking about. Um, so if you were to chase down these names, you find out that that goes back a long ways into their genealogy to help you understand, you know, these are these are people through the generations, their their family names, and these are the people that are present from those families and from those particular tribes. So then, of course, in Benjamin, uh, you have you have them, uh, the people who are mentioned there, and then it uh, it says Joel in verse nine, the son of Zikri was their overseer in Judah the son of Shenua, the second over the city. And then verse 10, of the priests, you had Jediah, the son of Joyrib and Joshin. But in verse 12, you said, now the brethren who did the work, or it says, the brethren who did the work of the house were 822. <coughs> and so it also gives you uh, a number of the actual people who had put their hand to the work as well. So it's leading up to the next chapter when there's going to be a dedication of all that has been prepared. And so once again, Nehemiah realizes that he is going back or he was sent back to, to do a particular task. It's a particular task that was also prophesied, importantly enough, and it should be recognized that all of this was already foretold by Isaiah he was the one that was saying even that it would be Cyrus who would begin the process with Zerubbabel. But uh, Nehemiah, we realized that even that, from the going forth of the, uh, of the decree that uh, to rebuild the temple written by Daniel, um, that this was also going to be one of the matters that would take place. So yeah, the, the captivity prophet Daniel wrote about the events that were fulfilled by Nehemiah and others. So, you know, he realizes, of course, he has to know the significance of this. And I, I believe that's why there's so much detail in the recording of people, tribes, destinations, pretty much everything that's there. The people that were famous and the people that were infamous. Uh, the people who were very much for the cause and the other ones who were the subversives. And so that's all detailed very, very well here. So it tells us... Um, in verse 13, and his brethren, the heads of the father's houses, were 242. And Amishai, the son of Azarel, the son of uh, Az Azhai, uh, the son of uh, Meshelamoth, the son of Amor. Notice uh, most of these I won't even uh, uh, try to pronounce out. But if you'll notice, the reason that it's done is to go back generation to generation to generation. Because there is also the question about who has the rights to this, who has the rights to that, whether it's land, position, function around the temple, if you're a Levite, or if you're a gatekeeper, all those kind of things. The family line is how that is passed down. So these are official positions, too, that are very, very important. And having representation was uh, the, a very important, not only that they would have the representation, but that they would be the rightful inheritors of these things. So that's why this is so detailed. So it says in verse 14, and of their brethren, mighty men of valor, there were 128, and their overseer was Zebdiel, the uh, son of, uh, of one of the great men. Now also of the Levites, and it gives you the details of the Levites. So, so far what we have here, we have those of Benjamin, those of Judah, those of the priests, and now of the Levites. So in the actual temple area and the surrounding areas, you would have the two tribes, and then you would have those who would be serving in Jerusalem at the temple, an entity within an entity, if you will. So Jerusalem, there is Judah, Jerusalem, and then there is the temple. So of course, Benjamin would be involved with this as well, and uh, they would have their people represented as well because it is the southern tribe, southern, southern tribes, it's the southern separation uh, from Israel, Israel and Judah. And so what you have are the people who have the official positions in that time. That's kind of what's being laid out for us here as we go through this. So it tells us uh, of the Levites in verse 18, um, of the Levites in the holy city, there were 284, which when you think about it for what is now a beginning nation, that's not a huge amount considering the amount of work that would be going on there.
Now it tells us verse 19, Moreover, the gatekeepers, uh, Actob, Talman, and their brethren who kept the gates were 122. And the keepers of the gates at this time would probably have a, even more of an official uh, kind of a title. But going back historically, keepers of the gates would be the people who would make sure that around the temple compound, everything kept its place orderly. It was kept clean and and clean and orderly is kind of the best way that we can put it. So the rest of Israel, of the priests and the Levites, they were there in the cities of Judah, everyone in his inheritance. And this is what's important. But the Nethanim dwelt at Ophel, and Ziha and Gish, uh, Gishba were over the Nethanim. And these were the people who would assist the Levites and um, uh, all of their, their work that they would do. So, so much support to the things happening at the temple, the sacrifices, the daily offerings, everything that would go on there took such an enormous amount of support. And over the years, it went just from, if you think about it, during the time of Moses and the children in the, the wilderness and, uh, you know, the wandering that they had done there, it was just a tabernacle. And so it was much smaller as far as the complex was concerned. And so seemingly smaller. David really kind of upscaled the whole thing when the, the um, uh, temple was built and so did Solomon, that there was so much more going on, so much more taking place for such a larger amount of people that the support for the temple and for a permanent location now within a city and a big portion of that city given over to this, <clears throat> the idea that you would need uh, uh, kind of a, a good number of people to do what you do. David even had them put in their designation so that you didn't just completely wear out the priests because there theirs was a, a constant uh, ministry that they would do. So just really important to, to recognize that by this time, what they're trying to put back is not what was done in the in the tabernacle, but what was being done before the fall of the temple at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. We're talking about the, the temple that was where Solomon had built it. That's the difference between those things. It's a much more formidable task. So, verse um, 23, For it was the king's command concerning them that certain portion would be given to the singers a quota of each day. I should have read verse 22, I'm sorry. Also the overseer of the Levites at Jerusalem was uh, Uzi, the son of Bani, the son of uh, Hashabiah, the son of Methaniah, the son of uh, Micah, of the sons of Asaph. And so that shows how far back we're going here. Now we're getting back into the Moses and Aaron times. I'm sorry, into the uh, back in the, the David times. So at, like the beginning of the kingdom ages, uh, the kingdom years. So really important that, we, that you see the people that were there present at the time. Well, what, what right do you have for this? Well, were of those people that David had used and had put in place and through the generations, these were the people that God had used. For it was the king's command concerning them that a certain portion should be to the singers a quota each day. That would be David. Uh, the king had put those things back in place. In verse 25 you get, And as for the villages with their fields, some of the children of Judah dwelt in Kirjath Arba and the rest of these, these places that are mentioned here. You can... If you want to try to uh, pull them up, you'll see in verse 31, also the children of Benjamin from Geba, they dwelt at Michmash and Aija and Bethel and their villages. And that's the stuff that's to the north uh, and even uh, uh, to the, for that matter, to the east as well. So the, the north and the east, and you can look all these up on a map. There's so many of them that are here. A map would help you to figure out where all of these ones came from in their in their settlements, if you will. But consider it pretty much most all of what we would consider the surrounding outskirts and all of the, the tributary kind of uh, villages and, and places where people would live. They were within traveling distance to, uh, to Jerusalem on any given day. So um, we see in verse uh, 12, or chapter 12, rather, verse 1. So I know I've skipped a lot of the verses here, but you're going to, if you go back and look at it, you, you should see that there's really not anything of content that's missed other than it's these people. And I'll be honest with you, as you look through it, if you if you try to run down these names kind of exhaustively, you'll find out that not all of them are mentioned. And so some of the names here are recorded, recorded for the first time, and you won't have any other detail given on them. And as I've said before, why then should we even bother? Why do we care? Um, it was 
monumentally important to them that these people would be recognized because again if it wasn't for this kind of history that had been recorded before them there would be no chain of custody no, no line within the family without a record there's nobody that could make the claim to these things and remember that their their tasks are very specific to their families and even to their tribes again if you wanted to be a priest you can't be a priest outside of being from the tribe of Levi, uh, Levi, but you had to be a direct descendant of Aaron for that to be possible. You could be of Levi, but unless you're, um, unless you're from Aaron, you can't be a priest. All you could be is a Levite, and that would be one who would serve in the temple or in service to the tribe itself. But it didn't have its own land allotment. Um, God said of Levi and to his descendants, they are my inheritance and I am theirs, basically. So I'm not giving them land. I will be their inheritance, which, gosh, what a, <laughs> what should have been the perfect thing turned out because of man's corruption to be such a curse. And it just shows that God was willing, but man was not. And boy, is that a, that's a study in its own, isn't it? So chapter 12. Now, these are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the, the, the son of uh, Shealtiel, uh, and Jeshua, Sariah, Jeremiah, and Ezra. And so these are the people who came in that succession. So from the, the beginning and the progression that came down, you'll see the people who are mentioned through this. Um, we won't go through all their names because, again, many of them don't appear elsewhere, or if they do, they're in a, in a list similar to this without any other detail. But remember what, again, this is for them to say, who then came back with, who came with Zerubbabel? We have the names of who came back with Ezra. We also have the name of those who came back with Nehemiah. And you can find those in the various writings of those groups of people. Ezra has the first two groups. He has Zerubbabel and he has those who came with him. And then you'll have from Nehemiah and some overlap here. Uh, Nehemiah is also mentioning back to things recorded in, uh, in uh, Ezra. So it tells us of these people who are here, uh, the last part of verse 7, these were the heads of the priests and the brethren in the days of Jeshua. Moreover, the Levites were um, Jeshua. And so remember, this is uh, the Levites who came with. That was the original group. This is the group that's more current. Verse 8, moreover, the Levites were uh, Jeshua, uh, Benui, uh, Cadmei, and then it goes on and explains you know, pretty much who these different people are. Um, of course, Judah is mentioned here, not the, not the Judah. <clears throat> but um, you, you get an idea where this all had its origins, because look at what's said here at the second part of verse 8. And Mathaniah, who led the thanksgiving psalms, he and his brethren. So the continuation of what they had been doing during David's time and the getting back to that, uh, the intent that, that it should have been all along, this was really Nehemiah's, uh, his desire, both he and Ezra, was to take what had been lost and what really created the problem in the first place to undo all of that, put the temple back in its place, the proper worship order, and the proper roles and responsibilities of the people, of the priests, of the Levites, and protect the place, build a fortification so that they have the freedom to do with what they to do what they would do. But you'll see that he's so careful. The idea that there's singers and there's gatekeepers and there's all the different functions all the way back from David's time. This is the importance of remembering your history. And <clears throat> remember, it's not a history that was just done by the will of man. This was a history that was in response to what God had done. And so David, if, let's go back and remember, it was David who said, I want to build God a house. It's not right that I have one of my own, but he, he dwells in a tent, basically, that idea that it was that temporary thing of Moses. And, of course, he gets the okay from Nathan, but then Nathan's got to go back because God said, I didn't tell you to tell him to build it. Tell him he's not going to build it, but Solomon, his son, will do it. And yet David had such a large hand in how this would all work. So back to this time. The people of Nehemiah's time see that what took place through the, the work of David and then ultimately Solomon, God was very well pleased with that. We can see it at the dedication of the temple. 
God promised that he would be there and that he would meet the people there and that it could be a place of corporate worship and that he would, be, he would do everything that they had requested of him, Solomon in particular, asking him. God said, I will. If you'll walk with me, I'll honor that you're doing that and I'll bless you. If not, and if you rebel against me, you're going to be left to your own devices ultimately. And this is, you know, we're, we're looking at it. This is one of many examples of when the nation strayed because they took their eyes off of what God had commanded them to do, gave them every conceivable blessing, but they rebelled. Well, Nehemiah is in a time such as that, like had not been seen before in that part of the world uh, because the Babylonians had come in and destroyed everything. And it laid waste for the 70 years that they were gone. Zerubbabel comes back, begins the job, but it takes more than 100 years for them to get to where Nehemiah is from the original group that, that came back. So it's just such a, I can, I think I, I, I kind of can feel a little bit of what it must have been like that after all these years of displacement, that we could be back to the place where God had, had sent us in the first place. Nehemiah would be able to see how much God's favor was in, uh, was on their work. Clearly, we, we know that from the first chapter. Nehemiah went before, uh, before the king, before Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes knew what was going on. There's something wrong. I could tell by, by the look on your face, if I paraphrase. And Nehemiah's response is, it's pretty hard to not, not have it on my face. I've heard from my brother the condition of things where we come from. And, of course, Artaxerxes asks, well, what can we do? And so he makes the request. I want to go back and rebuild. I want to go ahead and, and make it like it was before. And he is sent back in the official capacity under the authorization of the king to go and do the rebuilding. And the king helps in the process and makes things available to them. And so he's not only the person who is a leader among the Jewish people, but he's also an official of the Persian king. And so the responsibility is enormous here. And yet he wants to be faithful to God above all things. It's just such a, such a terrific story. So um, we see the genealogy of the priests, and that begins at uh, verse 10. And again, again, you can look through this, and you can run down the names, and you can see it goes back for the generations. This is for their consideration much more than it is for ours. So again, it's, a, it's an official recognition of who did what, but also... Because it exists, and genealogies like this, someone could make the claim to a land or a position or anything else and have the ability to prove why they should be taken seriously. It's just fascinating how careful they are about their history. And gosh, I wish all nations were careful about their history. Verse 22. During the reign of Darius, the Persian, a record was kept of the Levites and the priests who had been heads of their fathers' houses in the days of Eliashib, Joida, uh, jo Johanan, and Judah, and the sons of Levi, the heads of the fathers' houses, until the days of Johanan and the son of uh, the son of Eliashib, were written in the book of the Chronicles. And the heads of the Levites were Hashabiah and Sherebiah and Jeshua, the son of Cadmiel. Uh, with their brothers across from them to praise and give thanks. Groups alternating with group uh, according to the command of David, the man of God. So once again, this is just more detail saying what we put in place this time around. And remember, this is Nehemiah looking back. Here's what we did. He's saying we went back and we put things in their order as they had been at the beginning of us having this place of corporate worship, of having a temple, of having a priesthood, of having the Levites, and all of the things that were taking place. When Nehemiah looks at this and says, when God said it would be okay for us to have a corporate place of worship like we have here, this is what it looked like. We have the record of it from David's time. What we want to do, because God was pleased with it then, let's put it back the way that it was back then, and let's honor that tradition and how it was. So it says, uh, verse 25, uh, Mathaniah, uh, uh, Bak Bak Buk Bakbukiah, um, these names are just impossible for me to uh, pronounce. They were gatekeepers, uh, keeping the watch on the storerooms and the gates. So we, at this point now, we find out that the gatekeepers were more than just watching the people come and go. They were also tasked with this kind of security. And remember, it was during Nehemiah's time back in Persia, from his first time into his second time, Tobiah had started to get back into these places and made an apartment for himself, seemingly somewhere in this area. 
And if you remember a couple of chapters back, when Nehemiah comes back from some time that he had in Persia and he sees him there and he sees all the stuff, it's like, well, where is God's stuff and why is Tobiah's stuff here? Basically takes everything that belongs to Tobiah and he throws it out, puts back in the things that are supposed to be there and really kind of goes after those people who shouldn't have let it happen in the first place. But that just shows the, the kind of drama, I guess you could say, that would be going on when God's trying to do this work. So it tells us in verse 27, now, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all the places to bring them to Jerusalem. Now, this kind of just fast forwards a little bit more. Again, this was, everything's been put in order, but now that everything has been completed and he's appointed, you know, not only has all the walls and everything been completed, but <clears throat> by doing so, they've put all the pieces in place where they would have an operational temple, they would have gates, they would have security, they would have walls, there would be people to watch over the things. Now at this point, there needs to be the priests and have them cleansed, have the people ritually cleansed, and now it's that recognition that God, look at what you have done. Look at what you've brought about. And again, there's so many applications to this that we can make for ourselves to recognize that though God uses us to do various things, at the end of the day, we really are people that he uses to bring about his desire. Did God want them back in the land? Absolutely. He told them that through Jeremiah. I'm going to bring you back at the end of 70 years. So Jeremiah 29, 30 into those, those areas. And he, he, he tells them in advance that they're going away in their captivity. And he tells them for how long. And that he says, but I'm going to bring you back. And there's so many other prophets that would speak about what would happen when they're back. And so... Nehemiah, in his official capacity, would have to be taking a look around and saying, things are back the way that they're supposed to be. Let us have a time of, of just solemn remembrance and recognition of what God has done. And that's what we see kind of taking place as we get to verse uh, 27. So, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites from all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness both with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals, with stringed instruments, and with harps. It's the first part of it. So the festive aspects of it. It's not one of those things about, God, we're just so glad that you, you know, brought us back. There's a real rejoicing among the people. And there were people who were employed for the reason of worship and making it something that was incredibly festive. And it was something that was, um, uh, it was intended to be celebratory. So it's more than just shouts and things that people would be saying, but there's music. Now, I remember this uh, from one of our trips to Israel. Um, if you've ever been to um, a bar mitzvah, so when a, a, a son has reached that age where he's considered as leaving from his childhood, a bar mitzvah takes place. And we were in the old city of Jerusalem and a bar mitzvah was happening. And we happened to be at an elevated place up on top of a synagogue and we're looking down into the square, a uh, very recognizable square there in the old city of Jerusalem. And we're hearing the, the sound of this music. And to our right, we could see some people coming out of, a, out of a street and some archways and whatnot. They'd just been making their way through the city. And so they come by in a procession to, you know, it was to my right as we're looking down. And there's balloons and there's music and people playing things and they're singing and they're clapping and they're they're celebrating as they're walking through the streets of Jerusalem. It would be one thing to say, you know, my son has gone from his childhood to his adolescence and it's that whole thing. And that could be done without all the pomp. Um, but it's a celebration that was going on. And that's just a kind of a, a very one small individual look at what would be the celebration of an entire city. And uh, I, I don't know that I've ever witnessed anything quite like what I think I'm, I'm being dis or is being described here. Because it's the whole city coming out. And when, when there are things going on in the old city, you know it because the buildings are all made of stone. And they're just one walkway and aisleway after another and gates and you know arches and all that stuff. So sound reverberates all throughout. The commotion of it must have been incredible. But of course, it would be celebrating and worship. How amazing. So it tells us in verse 30, um, the priests and the Levites, they purified themselves, and then they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. This is all ritual. Ritual cleansing of making themselves prepared for their use. 
And so when a priest would be ritually cleansed, there was a lot of cleansing that would go on, and God would recognize the heart of the matter, but there would be a ceremonial cleaning that would go on. Uh, if a person was going to the temple, they would have to go into or into the synagogues, would have to go through what's called a, 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 a mitzvah. Um, not a mitzvah. Um, oh, goodness. Oh, good. I'll, I'll think about it in a moment. They had to walk in through, um, in, into water down one side and back up the other side. It was a, a, a ritual cleansing that would go on. They were just a, kind of a bath. And so this idea of being ritually cleansed, a um, very important part of, uh, of the preparation. Um, mikvah, that's the word I was looking for. It's a mikvah. You walk down into it and walk back out. Um, there's ones, just since I'm talking about it, there's ones that you see still to this day in some of the ruins of the old city just outside of the temple wall and uh, where the roads all caved in, um, just where there used to be an arch and, and uh, it's on the western wall at the southern uh, portion and people used to go up there. There were mikvahs, large ones, beyond it so that people could go in for their ceremonial cleansing before going up the steps and to the temple. You can still visit it to this day. So, in, uh, in verse uh, 32, it says, Now after them, um, I'm sorry, uh, verse 31, So they, they brought the elders, or the leaders rather, of Judah up on the wall, and appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand, and the other went towards the refuse gate. And after them went uh, Hoshishiah, or Hoshiah, and uh, half of the leaders of Judah, and then the rest of these people, and then the other group went in the other direction. So, again, this idea of working your way through the city and doing the singing and the celebration and all of it. Remember, why is all of this being done? What's the purpose behind it? Simply put, the purpose behind it is that there could be corporate recognition of the people that we are not only brought back into the land after our captivity, but in order to avoid a repeat of that, we're, we want to get back to the way that things were when we prospered as a nation under David, that the proper worship was taking place, the people were engaged in it, and were participants in it. The idea of offering verbally, outwardly, celebration and thanksgiving to God that they had been brought back but the hopefulness, too, is that there would be a real dedication of the heart of man going forward to, to walk rightly before God. And it happened for a while. We know that. But history records that it all came crashing down as we'll start to study through these things as we go through it. Usually, now, the other thing to remember here, ordinarily, um, where we would be at the end of Nehemiah is really leading into the post-exile prophets. So, in particular... We start thinking of like Zechariah and we think of Malachi. We think of those guys that are kind of towards the end of it, though we don't get to those minor prophets till way, way down the road. And so um, because there's all the other pieces in between before we even get to the major prophets. So we've got to get through Esther and we've got to get through Job and Psalms and Proverbs and all of those books first before we make it over to the prophets. But just remember that most of the work of the prophets and most of the writing of the prophets are already historical to this time. They've already taken place. You only have a couple, uh, three, I think, uh, of that we would consider as kind of post-exile speaking directly to, to uh, Judah and Benjamin. So we won't get to those because we're, we're in a different place. We'll have to wait till we get to the prophets. But I think what I probably will do is we get to Esther. I think it would probably be good to put up a timeline here uh, that we could take a look of who is doing what, as we consider like from Isaiah to Jeremiah and then during the captivity is when you have the writings of Ezekiel and Daniel and uh, then you start to see the minor prophets that were before and during and after uh, those those times and then right here with Nehemiah it's after and so is Ezra. Uh, Esther is actually during the uh, captivity. So really interesting when you start to put together all the pieces you have uh, books that are prophets and books that are historical. These happen to be in the historical part of the Old Testament, but they belong to the time that we would consider the kings and the prophets. Um, although there's not really a king from this point on. The last of the kings fell when Jerusalem fell uh, at the hands of the Babylonians. So with all that said, let's continue on. 
So as you read through um, pretty much from verses 32 and you go through it, the Thanksgiving choir shows about where they, who they were, where they made their way through and where they went. And then we get to verse 43 where it says, Also, that day they offered great sacrifices and they rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. That explains why all of this was done. Because this was done in a way of trying to honor God for what he had done. And that's the recognition of it. So it's them looking back, we're grateful for what God has done, and we want that to be said openly. And they did so with emotion and with force and with excitement and with joy. <laughs> Gosh, shouldn't that be the condition of the church when we can consider all that God has done? So, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those people that, that says, hey, when you're at church and you start singing, I want you to get up out of your seats and run up and down the aisles. We're not supposed to bring attention to ourselves. Things are different. We want God to be the center of all attention and the work of the Spirit going on through, the, through what takes place. But if people in worship, and I'm not the most demonstrative person in worship, but when I see people who are at, at, in time of worship, if they're raising their hands and if they're engaged in worship, hey, I'm, I'm all on board with that because these are people who are recognizing and pouring out their heart and their, their thanksgiving and their, their genuine um, uh, gratitude towards the God who saved them. So that's what worship should be. And uh, I know it's kind of a human element. It's a human trait to just go, I wonder if people are watching me. What are they going to think if they see me do this and all the rest of it? Just don't make a spectacle of yourself. But at the same time, we're not supposed to reserve ourselves so much that it really robs us of the affection that we have towards God and our gratitude towards him and showing, uh, showing that outwardly. So, um, verse 44. So at the same time, or at the time rather, uh, I'm sorry, at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms and the storehouses for the offerings, for the first fruits and for the tithes, to gather them into the, uh, from the fields of the cities and the portions specified by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levi Levites who ministered. Again, the way that it's supposed to be. This is the original intent of everything that was supposed to be going on. God's the one who said what tribe will do what. In this case, it's the descendants of Levi who will be my servants there in the temple. The priests who do the, the, the offerings and all the rest will be descendants of Aaron. And because that is their full-time work, it is for the people to see to their needs. Because they have their task, the rest of the nation will support that. So this really kind of, you know, it, it's where we get the understanding of tithe from which is so often misrepresented in the church, but the principle remains. The principle is if there are people that God has put into the full-time position of ministering to the flock, the idea that the flock would help to take care of their needs in the absence of them being able to work for their own, if the, if the ministry can support them, it's why I've never had a problem with it. Now, again, I don't get a salary from anybody else. I, don't get a, I have nothing that comes to me from Old Path Though that's still my church in uh, in California, not mine as possession. That's that's where we come from. That's where our heritage is. That's where our family is as a church. It's there in Cypress, California. We love them and we visit them often. But I don't take anything from the from the church. And uh, so whatever comes in is just support because of the ministry that people feel that I do. If they do, they support it. But the idea that that uh, people who make it their full time work in ministry. Uh, that they would be supported, really that's, that's what was taking place here at the time. So if they're fully invested at full time of ministering to the people, then the people took care of them as it was here at this time. So again, if, if a pastor tells you you've got to pay 10% because you've got to obligate yourself to the tithe, that's not biblical. If you want to give of what God has given to you because you support the ministry, that's a whole different matter. But don't let somebody lay the tithe trip on you. So verse 45, now, both the singers and the gatekeepers, they kept charge <coughs> um, uh, charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon, his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. Now, in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and for the gatekeepers a portion for each day, 
They also consecrated holy things for the Levites, and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron, meaning the priests. So again, what it shows is that there was a cooperation between the people and the corporate worship. So the people having a stake in the well-being and the maintenance of the temple meant a number of things. First of all, the temple would have what it would need in order to function, but the people would be invested in making sure that those things took place. So there was a, a not only a symbiotic relationship, but there was a dependence one upon the other. The people depended on the priest to keep the offerings going and keep them rightly walking before the Lord. That was the work of the priests and the Levites. The people would say, well, we support what you're doing because our relationship with God is so very important. We will take care of your needs so that you're able to serve us full time in that. This is the way it should work. Again, with the focus first and foremost, how may we in the task that we have been tasked with, how do we please God most effectively, most completely, and in accordance with his will? That's what we want to know from the text. They had theirs. So let's leave the church out for a second. They had their text. It's the law. Here's what's supposed to go on as far as your, your worship is concerned. God allowed much more detail to be added to it once a permanent, larger, much larger location and everything needed to support it came into place. God allowed that to be done through David. And so people had their specific roles and all the rest of it, and the people were to support it. But the idea of the people supporting the priesthood and the Levites, that has been in place since the time of Moses. Now, as far as the church is concerned, we already talked about you know the, the idea of support. But the relationship that there is from, from the people that just kind of come in to the people that serve them, to the pastor who teaches, to the musicians who sing and worship and lead the people in worship, all of these should be at operation at all time in the church, but not so that it becomes a business. This should be something that you could do if you couldn't plug in any lights or any musical uh, instruments or any of that stuff. All of the modern trappings. Here's a great way, or a great way of putting it. What would happen to your church if it was the church that you attend? If the entire church was just catapulted back into the year 1810, how would it function? We don't have any multimedia. We don't have any electricity. We don't have this. We don't have that. All right. Well, do you have a Bible? Do you have daylight, or do you have candles, or some kind of lighting that you can read your Bibles? Do you have people who know how to play an instrument a cappella, you know, sing a cappella, or play an instrument that's unplugged? If you can do all that, then that means that that church really kind of is able to go wherever at whatever time because it's it's not founded on all the modern things. Modern things are convenient. I mean, let's face it, we're doing this Bible study. It's going to be put up on the internet for people to watch. So I don't have a problem with technology. But I want to make sure that what we do and how we present things here and in any church that wants to operate properly, are we able to say that no matter the circumstances, no matter where we might find ourselves, we could do, quote, church anywhere that God puts us, regardless of what we have in our hands. If we have a Bible and a way to read it, we can do church. doesn't need anything else. So I, I find that to be an interesting challenge that many churches, if that was something that had happened to them and they had no power, and uh, people just showed up and they lost power once everybody's sitting in the seat, what would happen? That's an interesting question. I'd love to see that being answered by people as they kind of consider this whole thing. I'd love it if pastors started thinking about that and, and then if they realized, man, we would be really in trouble, maybe they could reevaluate the way that they do things. I think that the days could come. It is this way in most of the rest of the world where the convenience of just getting up on a Sunday morning and deciding whether we want to go or not is a luxury that they don't have. Um, it's any time that I go to be with the brothers and sisters of like belief, we're taking our lives in our own hands. I mean, that's what it's like for most of the rest of the world. So with all of that, we're going to pick up in chapter 13 next week. We'll complete the book, and then we will uh, finish up by going through es uh, Esther and looking at uh, another historical part that is happening during the time of the captivity. And a uh, really, really interesting book. But I think I'll, put up, I'll like maybe put up a timeline of what all was taking place from the beginning of the kings through the captivity, including these guys here and what was taking place. And I'll look for something that really kind of goes through uh, that whole thing so it helps put into perspective where we are in the historical as opposed to the prophets 
because they're, they're simultaneous history. They're just separated depending on where they are placed because of where they're placed in the actual Bible itself in the 39 books of the Old Testament. So we'll pick up there next week and uh, cl- uh, complete the book of Nehemiah. Uh, join us on Thursday because we're going to start the book of Hebrews. I'm looking forward to that. I'm fascinated with that book. Always have been. And look forward to going through it with you. Uh, I think my third or fourth time through it as the pastor. And uh, I look forward to sharing that with you uh, starting this coming Thursday. So uh, I would just ask that you take the time to study through God's Word. 13th chapter of Nehemiah is terrific. I think that you'll find it really, really uh, wonderful and useful and uh, challenging. Um, really great chapter. So we'll pick up there next week. Again, if you have any questions, uh, contact me through the ministry website at oldpaththeology.net. And I look forward to seeing you the next time.